Hello, and welcome back to Prism and Company. On the docket today, a VR. <sighs> um, today I am VRing. Let's see, I want to get her name right. It is Anna Astro Lady Tarot. Delightful. Thank you, Anna, for kicking us off with this lovely tarot tag. Your number one favorite deck. Or let's see, the official hashtag is hashtag your favorite tarot. Now, if anybody knows me, this will not come as a surprise to you, but my favorite tarot deck is the Thoth. Ah, delightful, delicious, delovely. Now, Miss Anna has prepared nine questions for us to delve into what makes this deck so incredibly special. And I say, let's not dither and dally around the bush. Let's dive right in with question number one. This is such a cheesy way to say this, but it's almost like this deck found me. And that doesn't actually mean anything, but what I mean by that is um, the very first tarot experience I ever had ever was with the Thoth deck. And I didn't know it at the time. It was a summer afternoon and some of my friends who thought that I would be into tarot, but knew that I would probably be really hesitant about it, led me into this room that they used for meditation and tarot and you know, various esoteric things, and sat me down and then handed me the deck and said, okay, Colin, we want you to just look through this and pick out the card that speaks to you the most. And I was just so taken by it. There is something very occult feeling about the Thoth deck. It's got very strange symbolism to it and beautiful art. And as I went through, I picked out the Emperor as my favorite card. And it, it just tickled both of them pink because I'm an Aries and this is the card representing Aries too. So I say that the Thoth kind of found me, but my friends really showed me the Thoth deck. And I just, it was like this intoxicating thing that I couldn't quite get to. They were very specific in telling me about how hard it was to read and how rare it was. Little did I know you could buy it on Amazon, but you know, people like to make things feel magical and cool. Uh, but it, I spent a long time almost being afraid of this deck. Like, like, ooh, I wanna touch it, but I don't wanna touch it like it's a hot stove or something. And then finally, once I got my hands on it, it wasn't my very first deck, but it was among my first decks. It just, it felt like home. And this is the system that I learned as well. So instead of starting with, say, Rider Waite Smith, I started with Thoth, and that has colored my entire tarot journey and probably will for a long time to come. There isn't much not to like about the deck, to be honest, at least in my opinion. Um, it is a pip deck, and I love me a pip deck because it allows so much flexibility for reading. The Three of Wands here is not depicting any particular scene, but it is depicting a sort of movement or a verb, if you will. So it allows you to read in in a way that you like while superimposing any sorts of meanings over it. I personally think this has the most successful court cards of any deck. Um, I find court cards to be really, uh, I don't even know, ill-defined at best, sort of tacked onto the whole tarot system. But the court cards in this deck are elemental overlaps. So the Queen of Cups here is the water suit because she's cups and the queens are water. So this is the watery part of water or like perfect still reflections where let's take the Queen of Discs here. Perfect. Still the watery part of the element because, oh no, yes, yes, because she's the queen, but she is the watery part of earth because she's the discs. So this is like hydrating a field. She is bounty and not harvesting. What's the opposite of harvesting? Planting, sowing. A lot of folks read the Empress like I read the Queen of Discs, that very generative force that way. So I love not only the pips, I also love the court cards because they make sense to me. They give me a framework in which I can work. I love and adore the colors and not only just the colors because many, many decks have beautiful colors, but there's an extremely specific system that these colors work off of. If you're not familiar, the Thoth deck is made by Aleister Crowley, who was the leader of an organization called the Golden Dawn for a long time and a member for a long time too. And the Golden Dawn has something called color scales for tarot decks. 
and it's related to the Tree of Life. If you're interested in those kind of symbols and shapes, I recommend checking out my why I renumbered the Trumps deck for the Ocean Dry Tarot, because I go a lot into the Tree of Life and how it's structured and where it breaks down. But anyway, here, there are colors that correlate to each suit in each position, and there's four colors specifically. So if we take a look at the Ten of Swords here, there is, I don't know all the names, you'll have to forgive me on that, but this dark crimson, there is orange, there is yellow, and there is this silver. So you'll see four colors show up in each of the minor cards, especially. Here we have this kind of Krulian blue, we have orange, we have purple, and we have yellow. And I just love how much thought really went into each of these. And because Lady Frida Harris, the artist, was using all the same colors, as you spread the deck out, you can start to see the same colors show up. It tells this color story as you do readings, which just adds so much into the narrative of what this deck is trying to tell. And I don't mean narrative as a whole deck start to finish reading it, say, like a book. I mean narrative when you shuffle the cards and pick three, let's say. Just for kicks, let's pick three. So I'm going to do a quickie little shuffle here. Let's grab one, two, three. One, two, whoo, three. Now looking here, just immediately through colors, you can see this same kind of dark tealy green carried through the cards, but we're getting less and less of it. So something is kind of lightening up as it goes. And that's just my first initial thought. You can see the same thing with the orange here. There's a predominance of orange, and then the orange is just in the wands. And then visually speaking, this is extremely dark. This is uh, orange, you know, kind of middle tones, and this is very bright. So the whole composition is going from a single color to many colors. It is going from dark to light. And that is just one of a million stories that this deck could tell. But because the same colors were used consistently, it breathes life into those stories. It allows those stories to be told so much easier. And beyond that, there are also little things like the card backs. I don't always like a card back, but there's something very occult feeling about the card backs on the Thoth Tarot. It is the, oh boy, the Rose Cross, I want to say, of the Golden Dawn, which just has all this ridiculous amount of meaning packed into it. There's all these petals within the rose at the center of the cross. Each side of this cross is representing one of the suits and also spirit. There's all of these um, symbols here in the edges. There's just so much junk packed in. But even without all the symbolism, which I do really appreciate, just the composition is very nice. It becomes so busy that your eye kind of unfocuses, almost like a magic eye poster, and just lets you take it in. And the fact that it's a giant cross with all these crazy colors in a rose makes it feel, I don't know, dangerous a little bit. Not Maybe not dangerous, but definitely occult, definitely esoteric. And maybe a little like spiritually naughty <laughs> in some ways, uh, just because a cross is such like a hot topic symbol to bring into something. And especially for something that has very little to do with actual Christianity. It's, it's awfully interesting. The Golden Dawn very, very frequently pulls on Christian symbolism, but isn't a Christian organization in and of themselves. I'll limit myself to just five words to describe this deck. Egotistical, energetic, unapologetic, cryptic, and beautiful. My primary use for this deck is reading tarot, which might sound like a really, really obvious answer, but that's not true of all my decks. Um, I have said it before, I read tarot like people read a book. I find so much more interest personally in going through the cards one at a time and finding narrative, going through and deciphering composition to see what you could glean from those compositions, analyzing color analyzing shape and style, seeing what symbolism people used. These are the types of things that I like to read with a tarot deck. But this one, because it's really sort of home base for me, it is the system that I learned from. These images are so incredibly iconic, it's become a beautiful reader. 
This is one that I don't have to stress about. I can just pick it up and get the answer I'm looking for. It almost feels like flashcards in some way because honestly, I use this as flashcards for years and years. I'm just, you know, like, what does the Prince of Discs mean? What does the Nine of Swords mean? And going through and memorizing keywords back when I thought that that was important and memorizing meanings and associations and all sorts of stuff. So now those things come to me really quick. And I'm very glad that I have a deck just for reading because if I didn't, I, I would read a heck of a lot less. No deck is perfect indeed. This deck is huge, like ridiculously huge. You will notice that I have it trimmed if you have this deck yourself. If this is the first time you're seeing it or you've not, you know, you're not familiar with the Thoth, there is a gigantic, I don't know, six and a half foot border around the outside. Um, it's it really cool. The original paintings by Lady Frida Harris were actually displayed in an art gallery with those hand-painted borders. So it's a beautiful nod to what this deck used to be and what the art used to be, but it's ridiculously hard to use. The other thing I'm not a big fan of in this deck are the keywords. There is a keyword for every one of the minor arcana. The Two of Wands, for example, is Dominion. Let's see here. The uh, Eight of Swords is Interference. There's all sorts of them for all these cards here. And I thought it was so important that I drilled those into my brain when I was younger. And younger, a few years ago when I learned tarot. And boy, have they just sort of stained every piece of knowledge I've had since then. If I could go back in time, if you are perhaps new to tarot and I could pass on a piece of advice to you, I would say, do not learn keywords for the cards, as tempting as it is. Instead, view them as sets. I wish I would have gone through and learned what all of the numbers mean in kind of a numerological sense, and then what all the suits mean, and then just sort of like mashed those together. And then once I had my foundational knowledge based on that, start lumping things like keywords or other information on top. Because it's really good, it's rich and juicy and important, but it is so powerful as a first tool to learn. Oh no. Oh no. Well, it's actually not that bad. Just a lot of cards. Okay. Trim it. 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 I would say trim it to someone who just got this deck. Partially because, oh my god, look at it. It's so beautiful. Um, partially because Lady Frida Harris actually recommended that people trim this deck because there is projective geometry all the way through it. Let me find some really good examples of this. Um, the High Priestess comes to mind. I will absolutely keep hunting until I find her. And if you back up some of the cards to each other, they line up in really interesting ways. So there is our High Priestess. And then let's take the Seven of Swords. Why not? All of these lines that sort of collide, they don't necessarily line up perfectly. Like they're not designed to be a seamless piece or anything. But all of these lines, this projective geometry interacts in cool ways. So she actually intended this deck for these images specifically to sit side by side. That way you could see the geometry play and flow and, you know, dance across the cards. Also, it chops off those nasty keywords. And I don't mind keywords, to be honest, but I don't think you should learn with keywords. And especially with the Thoth, it has such a stigma already. You don't need words like cruelty and defeat and all this, you know, weaseling their way in. Sure, there is plenty of, you know, darkness and negativity within tarot. But you can superimpose that on literally any card. If the Two of Cups comes up in a spread under what is the most dangerous thing in my life right now, this is going to be a negative card, even though people almost never read it that way. So... Just get in the Thoth, trim it, baby. I am a big proponent of leaving decks in their boxes when possible, but the Thoth deck I trimmed the absolute crap out of, so the box is no longer relevant, like it's far too small. I also threw it out a million and ten years ago. Um, when I first started keeping decks, I was like, who wants all these boxes? I don't have room for these boxes. And now I'm like, no, it's very handy to store the object in its box that it came in because it, it fits very nicely on the shelf. 
Anyway, I digress. The Thoth actually has my most elaborate storage solution because it's really special to me, so I want to keep it safe. I also scent my deck using incense, so that is all kept within this box. And I just think this box fits really well for the Thoth. It's got this big old cross on it, very similar to the crosses on the back of the cards. And then inside of this box, I keep it in a handmade pouch. One of my friends who actually introduced me to the deck, one of those two friends, made this pouch for me. The entire thing is lined in black on the inside. And while I don't really have any deck superstitions, I kind of love the conceptual idea that this deck isn't being tainted by any other colors or outside influences. It is just within this pouch itself. And I wrote the number 217 on it because I'm absolutely obsessed with the number 217. And there's a 217 Easter egg in this deck too, which I'll try and remember to show you later here. If not, you can reference my top five favorite decks video, which I go over it. But in this box, I also keep two sticks of my very favorite incense, India Moon. I just love the aroma of this. And it's a very smoky incense. So, and it's a short one too, so it burns quick. And as often as I can remember, I light a, some India Moon in this box. I usually kind of light it like this and then close the lid on it to keep the smoke inside. And then I will open it up, put my two fresh sticks of India Moon in, and put the deck in. So that way, it sort of seeps in there, and the, the flavor gets flavor blasted by India Moon. And every time I open up this deck, it just wafts out the aroma of this incense. And it doesn't smell smoky, and that's my least favorite part of incense is the smoke. It just smells like the actual incense itself. But something about burning it in this wood box and keeping the incense sticks in there just gives it this delicious, delectable flavor. Oh, I love it. I sure do. So funny enough, I don't actually want to do this in this VR. I think this is what most people want to see is like all the cards and the the walkthrough and you know the the image breakdown. This is what I do on my channel most often. I take a deck and I break its images down in, you know, long form discussions. I just filmed a video recently which is gonna go up on Christmas actually, about the carnival at the end of the world tarot. And I talk about it for 40 minutes and I get through nine cards. Like I love digesting images and getting in there, but I will flip through the deck here really quickly and just leave you with some of my overall thoughts as to not spend literally a lifetime on this. If you get the Thoth deck or if you have the Thoth deck, the thing I encourage you to look at the most are the lines. There are lines in nearly every image that refer to this projective geometry that Lady Frida Harris was so masterful at crafting. And it's this geometry that really gives the deck a very special flavor to me and to a lot of other folks as well. The other thing to focus on would be the colors. With all these specific colors of the color scales, there is just no end to the amount of small connections you can draw between cards just based on which cards feature which colors. And I think that's amazing. I'm gonna actually pick this up so I can flip through a little bit faster here. The last thing I will leave you with to you know, look at or work with on these cards is the way that they build space. It's very flat space in some ways. You can very much see it here in the Seven of Cups. We have this ooze that kind of goes into the background, but the whole composition feels very flat. Everything that's dripping is almost optical illusion style dripping in the same plane. It is the same distance away from the camera or the lens, if you will, but it's falling into different spots in the background. So it, it's a very flat way to depict images, but it's got this sort of optical illusion in it. Then you superimpose the projective geometry on top of that, and it just creates this incredible experience where you're never quite sure what you're seeing. And I think that actually works really well with how Crowley intended this deck to be read, which is you're not really quite sure what you're reading either. Now I have my own thoughts about how he chose to present information, which I find very frustrating. Um, but I think ultimately what he had to say was very cool. And I think his take on tarot and his take on magic and life and all that is is one that is worth exploring if you can get past his 
crunchy exterior, which a lot of folks can, and I would never blame you for. Well, thank you so much for joining me, everybody. This was a real blast um, to kind of mix things up a little bit and just join the community in a tarot tag. It's what I kicked my channel off with and hopefully something I get to revisit every now and then as well. But until next time, folks, I will see you later and I might just do a reading with the Thoth since it's out and all. And I'm going to enjoy that. Bye-bye.